recording. Should I also record screen record? I feel like I should. So I'm going to do that as well. Okay, so this is already recording. That sounds good. Hi, my name is JR Yusuf, and I am the host of the YouTube channel Just JR. And today I am joined by Shara. I have a very special guest, and their pronouns are they and them, and Z and Zim. So, just a little bit more about Shara. Shara runs the account The Black Bisexual on Instagram and Twitter. They are also a college student. They are also a plant parent and they believe in all things intersectional. So that means the rights of like disabled people. That means the rights of queer people. That means the rights of people of color. And today we are going to be having a conversation about disability and bisexuality and about LGBT people and things like that. So to kick us off, I wanna just read what disability is. And this is going to be coming from byresource.org. So a disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. It has been found that more LGB, it has been found that more LGB folks have disabilities than their heterosexual counterparts. When people hear the word, they have different ideas about what it means in a social context. And there can be a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. People with disabilities may use different labels to describe themselves, such as disabled, a person with a disability, or differently abled. Whatever, terminal whatever terminology a person uses, only they and perhaps the medical professionals with whom they work can say if they have a disability or not. Physical illnesses, mental illnesses, injuries, and chronic pain can all potentially result in both visible and invisible disabilities, and all should be accommodated in the bisexual community. Okay, so how do you feel about what I just read? Like, do you feel like that definition of disability was like accurate or uh, all encompassing or? I feel like it was very medicalized, but it doesn't discuss anything about the person. It basically states that disability is this and this when in retrospect, disability is a many shaded thing. Someone that has several disabilities, but they're not visible, you know, could be seen one way, whereas someone that is walking with a cane, oh, that person's disabled. Well, you don't know that. So um, I don't really like a lot of medical definitions, but I understand the purpose of them. The purpose is usually political or um, social. So yeah, uh, I haven't found a definition of disability that I like yet. So, but that's just me. That's just me. I'm, I'm a picky crip. So yeah. I hear you. <laughs> so uh, I, I really appreciated what you just said. You, you talked about how it didn't talk about the person and the individual. And in a bit of the research that I did to prepare for this conversation, that was like a huge theme throughout everything. It was like, well, everybody's an individual, first of all. Like, mm -hmm. we all have hobbies, we all have interests, we all have, we all come mm -hmm. from various socioeconomic uh, standpoints. And so I kind of wanted to kick off the interview with a really simple question about like, what are some of your hobbies? I know you talked about being a plant parent, but do you have any other hobbies mm -hmm. that you want to share? My, okay, besides being a plant parent and owning like, if not over, but close to a hundred plants, thank you, pandemic. Uh, I am, I, I'm really a sociologist at heart. I like to research. I've currently been going on a journey of researching my own disability and um, going through the process of being tested on it. Uh, yes, that is actually my hobby right now. I know someone's just like, wait, are you serious? You you do that? Yeah, I have um, adult ADHD. So when I get interested in something, sometimes I hyper-focus, sometimes I just 
uh, I just throw myself into things. So I'm researching a lot on my disability. I'm researching ADHD in general. I'm researching um, a lot of social justice issues. I, I I like to read, as you can tell. I love reading new articles. I love um, reading a lot of nonfiction as well as fiction. What else do I like to do? I like to sleep. <laughs> Right. <laughs> hey, I love to sleep. If you give me ten minutes in my bonnet, I will be out. I promise you. <laughs> I feel you. And mm. like I got into throughout the pandemic, like I bought these pajamas and like they are the most comfortable, like silk pajamas. And like anytime I'm like having a hard day or like <laughs> if like if I I don't know, like if I want to treat myself, I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna put my pajamas, I'm gonna put my special pajamas on and just get in the bed and like curl up mm -hmm. and you know that actually like that helps you because whatever is bothering you oh i'm having a bad day or oh, this is really hard once you put those pajamas those special pajamas on now you are you know you're you're moving your your mind and your body out of a space of negativity to positivity because all you have are positive thoughts connected to these pajamas so once you curl up it's it's over it's over put you some netflix on and let netflix watch you so let netflix watch you i'm weak that's so funny um <laughs> yes exactly and so i love to read i like to go outside for like walks and be in nature and stuff like that. I like to write. I, what are some of my other hobbies? I just got into like gaming again after like a 15 year long hiatus. <laughs> so Ooh. cool to be back. Yeah. So I got a switch during the pandemic and so I've been playing it here and there. Yeah. So, uh, okay. that is, that is okay. yeah. And so I also wanted to ask, what are some like superpowers? Would you, what kind of superpowers would you want to have if you could have any superpowers? <sighs> okay, now see, this one, this one's always been kind of a hard question for yeah. me because I am a comic book nerd. So when you ask me this, it's like, I can give you the rundown on why every, almost every superpower would be good, but I would say, telekinesis i would i've always wanted that one because it's it's very versatile i could um push gravity away and i could fly i could um it's just basically manipulating the world around you using your mind and i'm just like i could do that yes yeah. the physical world with my mind i yes yeah, yes. yeah. so telekinesis so yes. I, and I need like Jean Grey strength. I don't need like, I don't want to be Captain. I mean, I don't want to be Professor X. No, because see, he's, his morals are skewed. I need to be Jean Grey all the it. way. So. Let's talk about it. I was mm -hmm. talking about it on Twitter the other day about how Professor X be sending these poor kids into battle to die. And he hasn't, he hasn't. He hasn't unpacked his own internalized um, anti-mutant. I don't know if there's a word for that, but his own, he hasn't yep. unpacked the anti-mutant his uh, own xenophobia xenophobia mm -hmm. or whatever right <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is and wild. then i kind of mm -hmm. And then it kind of gave me a feel because i'm just like okay you have this powerful mind but see he's a he's a he's not it's not telekinesis it's um Oh God, it's the other one you use with your mind and I can't think about it, but he's that. He can basically telepathy. manipulate other people. Yeah, telepathy, thank you. Mm -hmm. He can basically manipulate other people's minds and see, I, I take issue with that. Mm, manipulation, that's a no-no. But um, I, he said these little kids out there and I'm like, okay, Mr. Wheelchair, I'm, I need you to get out there first, please. Oh my God. please. You're the adult. <laughs> please. You're the adult. Mm. Right. But see, the '90s, the '90s X Men, everyone was an adult, and I like that one better because right. people right. have more free will. Right. So, right. Yeah. It's true. Right. But anyway, I was gonna say something. I'm gonna just say it. Yeah. But like, I I don't know. Like, obviously, they showed us all of his team members having free will. But I always, I don't know. Since he's, since he's, he has telepathy. I always question, like, well, are they really doing this because they want to do it, or is it one of those? Because I think, I think in some of the comic comic books, like, there's like, um, 
like secondary powers that like oh if you're in people's aura if you're pe around people they just start to like mm -hmm. be influenced by you even like you're not even trying to do that but anyway that's mm -hmm. i'm learning out a little bit but anyway <laughs> um <laughs> it's okay it's okay i'm here with you i'm okay. here with you okay mm -hmm. so <laughs> um yeah i think my superpowers would be similar to yours i think mine would be like molecular manipulation uh, Ooh, okay so yes, so yes. Many you can do the telepathy you i mean the uh, telekinesis you can do moving through walls like kitty pride you can do teleportation mm -hmm. hurt you can do like so many things so yeah i really like that one because it it you have to be creative with that with that power yeah you know? that's kind of what you were getting and see at. Pieces. And so you can break things down to its smallest molecule so that if you move them quickly, you can move past them. If you move them slowly, you've made things heavier. So, okay, I, I see you. I see you. Mm -hmm, JR. Okay. We out here trying to do the most. Okay. I see you. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I had to, I had to have a good answer because yours was so good. Uh, so, so yeah. So on the same vein of superpowers, right? So Marvel's Runaways on Hulu features Gert, mm -hmm. who is a hero who has spoken about her mental illnesses, anxiety, and depression, mm -hmm. as well as debilitating migraines. And I think the writers were hinting that another hero named Molly was neurodivergent. Though mm -hmm. they may have just been trying to illustrate that Molly was very, very young in comparison to her other teammates, how do you feel about representation of disabled superheroes in general? And maybe more specifically, how about black disabled superheroes? Um, in general, I haven't seen a lot of representation with disabled pe people in comic books. I did read the Hawkeye series where he lost his hearing. I bought that whole series. It's uh, I, I had to spend the $40 on that book. Whew, that hurt. But just to see a superhero wear a hearing aid, just to see, you know, a superhero have to go through all the, you know, go through life being different. That's what anyone would want to see. Anyone would want to see the representation. We see Professor X in a week wheelchair but we don't see him in a wheelchair all the time you know he turns he goes into the astral plane and now he's walking or he's in his own mental state and he's standing and having a conversation so there's always this you know wish to be wish to walk or wish to be like everyone else and i don't i don't like to use the term normal because i get on my damn nerves there's no such thing as normal but I don't see enough representation in comics when I see disabled people. And then when I do see them, it's always the same narrative of the cishet white man. Daredevil, he's blind. He's a cishet white man. Professor X, he is in a wheelchair uh, from a spinal injury. Cishet white male. Um, hold on, hold on. Hawkeye, cishet white male. So these are the only people that have disabilities. Now, as you discuss Runaway, this is interesting because I have not seen this in the actual comic books. So if they are doing this in a show, I would definitely love to see it, which I did see all of season one, but I kind of fell off. So we're not going to get into that. But I would love to see the representation. Mm. I hear you. And I know I'm not the only one that feels this way because representation is important for any social group, for any community. When you can see someone that, when you can see yourself reflected back on the screen, it validates your existence. And art is supposed to mirror life. So when you see people, when you see TV and you don't see yourself, it's kind of like, well, what Twilight Zone are they living in? Because I see people like this all the time. Or why aren't there people like this that are seen more often? Because, again, these people should be represented. But that's just me. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. And that what you just said reminds me of being a kid and turn, turning on movies or, or the TV or whatever, and it just kind of, kind of almost always being white people. But I mean, 
me and my sisters, we found, you know, UPN and, you know, mm-hmm. chance mm-hmm. with Black people on it. But it was odd. It was just weird because I grew up in a predominantly Black neighborhood. So I rarely ever saw white people. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. I did live across the street from a synagogue. So I saw white Jewish people. But mm-hmm. I didn't really. I, I didn't ever really feel like a minority because of my race. So it was always like a disconnect of like, well, I'm always around like tons of various kinds of black people, but on TV, there's like a one particular kind or there's hardly any at all. So yeah, that disconnect between like what you experience in reality versus what is shown on TVs and movies is always a doozy. But then also I think mm-hmm. that I think that representation has its limits. And for me personally, I think that I would much prefer to be protected and accommodated in real life than I would be represented. And I know this is not like an either or game. And I know oftentimes in order to be protected in society, you like representation sometimes comes first or, or whatever, but You know, I think for the last couple of years in particular, there's just been so much conversation like, oh, representation matters. And obviously it does in in so many ways. And it also has its limitations. And disabled people, (laughs) protection, (laughs) consideration, (laughs) um, thoughtfulness. Yes, representation. Yes, definitely. All of Mm -hmm. it. All of mm-hmm. it happening. Um, for representation, you make a very good point where you state that, that you know, um, it, and it it makes me think of well, not everyone can be rep- represented because you're. I'm not going to see exactly me on the screen. I already know that, and you know, you can't represent everyone. And that's wonderful. But then you go, then I go back to the point that you said, when you watch TV, you only saw one specific type of black person. That makes me uncomfortable because we are not a monolith. We are a very broad and wide community. You're on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. So that that creates difference right there. But if I do see T'Challa hanging out in Manhattan, I'm still going to root for him with all of my little black soul. But representation does matter. Representation matters, especially in intersections. When you have someone that is not white, when you have someone that is not cis, when you have someone that is not male, you are opening up the ability for people to see themselves. If I don't see myself in a person, you know, for their gender, I see my I see myself in them for their ability or their disability. I see myself in someone that is a first gen student. They don't I don't have to connect with them at all points, but at least I have enough points to connect with them. Um, with disability, it's it's very hard because now now life is imitating art, which is weird because, um, and it's supposed to be the other way around, but you know, I, I don't want to fight with my artist friends on that one. I really don't. When I say that I'm disabled, I will literally get the whole scan of my body and be like, where? And it's, and it's like, I, what do you mean where? And then I have to go into this whole thing of proving myself because when you see disabled, you see the decals when you're about to park, they're blue, it's a little person in a wheelchair. When you, and it's this reinforced message of it's someone physically disabled. So when someone has a mental disability, when someone has a um, intellectual disability, now it's it goes into this whole, we'll prove it. So this is why representation matters, because if you're having conversations around mental disabilities, if you're having conversations around intellectual disabilities or chronic illness, people now have that language. And it's like, oh, I saw this one time. Yeah, okay. I don't know exactly what you're going through because TV is TV and not real life. But I understand and I have the language to understand what you're talking about. And I have that reference point from the TV, even though the TV didn't get it all right, but it's like, at least, oh, well, I saw that episode with that person 
and blah blah mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is so frustrating though because <laughs> i just like mm-hmm. it's it's it's, uh, it's so frustrating because this is reminding me of like how i would say over the last maybe like three or four years in real life some of my friends and family members have sort of like not come around but like they're like wow bisexual men or bisexual people go through so much and i'm like yeah thank yeah. you and, thank and you I've been like, okay I've been saying this i'm i'm 32 right now mm-hmm. i've been saying this to these people for, <laughs> for mm-hmm. a long time i've been saying it and they know me i'm not a stranger they know me but it took yep. for them to like see it on tv or it took for them to see it on the timeline oh like bisexual mm-hmm. men getting dragged, or bisexual people getting dragged and i'm like yeah i've mm-hmm. been saying the same things i've been saying these same mm-hmm. things i've been saying these same things for years <laughs> for years it's and like, like i'm not lying <laughs> and i'm not playing the oppression olympics trust oh. and believe it's hard out here for a bisexual, no matter what your gender is, it is hard out here for a bisexual. And I gotta give it up to you. I thank you so much, JR, for what you do on YouTube. You educated me, you inspire me. I watch your stuff and I'm sitting here and I'm just like, someone gets it. Oh my God, someone gets it. But why do why do we have to get it in the community? Why can't the folks outside get it? <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. That that's very very sweet. I just mm-hmm. I'm just like it's I I guess it's good that they finally came around but it doesn't make me feel good. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make me feel good cuz you haven't been listening to me. Yep. Yep. You haven't been, you listening. Haven't been validating me. You've you've list it's gone through one ear and out the other and like yeah, well, you know, you know it's whatever, but then once they hear it from someone else, once they watch it on TV, then it's all of a sudden, oh, you know what? Yeah, you was right. Okay, I don't, I don't need the, I don't need the, you was right. I need the support. Can I get the support now? Uh, okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So on to the next question. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we'll spend a minute there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a breathing exercise after all of this is over because I'm really irritated. Um, so we've seen a rise in accessibility at the start of the pandemic, with everything from medical professionals being willing to consider virtual checkups for once to sign language interpreters being present for many virtual events to virtual courses with schools being mandatory for some. As we get back to normal, do you think we will see a decline in this accessibility? And how do you feel about this conditional accessibility that centers abled people? Um, well, first off, there is no such thing as normal. We had a significant amount of people to pass away Away from the pandemic. So just bouncing back and saying, let's go back to the way things used to be, that's not possible. So when people state, you know, oh, we're going to get back to normal. No, everyone I know and some people I don't know have lost family, have lost friends, have lost just loved ones in general. So there is no possible way that the way things were in 2019 and early 2020, we can never get back to that ever. That's not possible. So the idea of getting back to normal is not only not possible, but it's also slightly offensive. So we should just ignore all of what happened in 2020 and just go forward. I don't, I don't know about you, Jr., but um, that's not how I process things. So that that is the first thing. The second thing is that accessibility always comes through the necessity of assisting able-bodied people. Um, a few, I want to say, a few months ago, when Nike came out with the shoe that kind of clicks on and clicks off, everyone talked about how lazy that shoe was 
because everyone talked about how, you know, the shoe was was ugly and how they could just make something, you know, America's getting so lazy. But what no one was listening to was the was the accessible and disabled rhetoric around it. You know, this is finally a shoe that I can put on myself where I don't need a Assistance. This is finally something, this is finally a way that I can take more autonomy over my body. So where mainstream is always going to call things quote unquote lazy, it's really kind of a charade just to market to disabled people, but in a way where, you know, we can't just market to one to disabled people because it's such a small group and you know they don't have a lot of money so if they market to the general public they'll usually get disabled dollars i like the accessibility i have been able to be in groups social groups all over the world when i'm awake because i'm not sitting up three in the morning for things that happen in greenwich not happening <laughs> i i have loved the ability to also be um uh, a little incognito because I don't have to be on camera. Uh, sometimes I fidget a lot, so that makes people uncomfortable. And the fact that I'm black, so we're not even going to get into the racist part of that. But um, the accessibility of things being online, so that means people that have access via phone, via, via laptop, via desktop, they're able to broaden their social circle so wide. The ability that people can work from home. So if you have a chronic illness, you don't have to, you know, as I say, you don't have to gauge how many spoons you're gonna need. You know, your bed is literally right, right behind you or you're sitting in bed doing all of the work that you've been trying to get accommodations for for years. So I think it's wonderful of these accessibilities, these accommodations, but what I fear is like everything else, you know, you know, this idea of getting back to normal is going to make all of these things inaccessible and dry up again. And I know a lot of people are fighting for it. I know when I order food, I know that they have curbside service and I continue to use it, even though I am fully vaccinated, even though I still wear a mask, I continue to use these services to show other places that they're still being used so don't get rid of them um uh, and yeah yeah it does it hurts my heart when i see things like, like oh we're gonna start meeting up in person again or oh we're gonna meet outside it's like no don't take away that virtual aspect you can also do both you know have one meeting yeah. online and one meeting um in person but i'm concerned that it is going to dry up and it bothers me so yeah I hear you. So the next question that I have is, what does your ideal accessible pride event feel, smell, look, and sound like? What technologies, what technologies are present? What modes of transportation are present? What accommodations have been made? OK. Um gonna tuck in for this one because this one gonna take a minute okay so um i would like to first preface that i am an able body disabled person so there will be some things that i may overlook because i am not going to speak for the whole community i'm only going to speak for me and i know about other modes of the disabled community so let's start with the transportation to get there so to get there, I'm thinking of those that are both physically, emotionally, and mentally disabled. So there will be um, wheelchair accessible vans, shuttles, and buses running every 15 to 20 minutes. And that is to and from the event. So um, even if like, oh, I missed the bus. Well, you know what? That's okay. We still have a shuttle and a van coming and uh and see what people don't understand is if it's accessible to disabled people it's accessible to everyone so if there's a bus or a van running every 15 minutes that's less you have to walk honey and sadly unlike the east coast anytime you have to walk you're walking for miles 
not blocks, miles. So um, everything is wheelchair accessible. Everything is power scooter accessible or power chair accessible because not one size does not fit all. Just because a power chair fits there does not mean a power wheelchair will fit does not mean a power scooter will fit. So I would make sure that the buses were accept accessible. The buses, vans, and shuttles were accessible for all three modes, as well as uh, ramps for those with canes or um, those who, you know, who have issues just mobility in general. So that's just getting there. Um, getting there itself, I mean, once you're there, I would say it would be scent free because there are people that, that have um, scent sensitivities. I personally do not have, well, I have seasonal allergies, that's different. But so I would, it would be scent free for the most part, but if you went to like certain booths or something and they had a scent, that'd be different. But for the most part, it would be scent free. Um, there would be bathrooms everywhere. Uh, these bathrooms would be large and accessible. Uh, I would say you you would trip where you see a trash can, you see a bathroom. So like every five, five steps, there'd be a bathroom. In the ba bathrooms, there would be personal care attendants. So even if you get there and you're like, oh, I can't transfer from my wheelchair to the toilet, there's, there's one or two people that are just there to assist. And um, I would say like they'd stand outside, they'd have a lanyard on and, you know, you just, you can just come and with like, a green, a, like a bright green shirt that says like staff or assistant staff. And you just ask them, hey, can I get some assistance? Yep, sure. So you don't have to, you know, have this awkward of how do I get my care assistant there if I need them? Or, you know, what am I going to do if I have to do certain things, you know, and I don't have help? Because I know a lot of um, physically disabled people will go if they go out they won't drink anything because they know as soon as they drink something they'll have to go to the bathroom so if they have to go to the bathroom well it's a whole you know it's a whole process and they don't want to they don't know if the bathroom is accessible they don't know if they can get assistance so they won't drink water and it's it's i drink water all day that's psychotic so no one should have to no one should have to be dehydrated just to go out and have fun. So I am uh, making sure that there's care assistance, not only in the bathrooms, but wherever there are food trucks. I am making sure there is a variety of foods because everyone has sensitivities to foods. There are foods we can't eat. You know, everyone thinks that, you know, it's so cache to be gluten-free, but I know some people that are disabled that if they had gluten, it would kill them literally kill them or send them to like, the hospital the so we're having yes thank you yeah they, that's exactly what it's called thank yeah, you yeah. so i'm having food trucks with not only like the greasy bits that we all like but like vegan food trucks i'm having vegetarian food trucks i'm having halal food trucks i'm having kosher food truck i'm having food trucks for anything you feel like you want if you just want corn we have a just corn for you. If you're just like, I just want a little shaved ice with some honey on it, boo, we got you. And okay, that's just the food. Whew. Um, see, I see, I get deep. I get deep. When you talk about the um, like pride itself is like one long parade, and then usually there's a concert or some type of carnival at the end. I want it to be wide. Okay, people are going to be everywhere on wheels, on canes, walking. So these these lanes, these streets need to be wide. I need um I need people that are walking to be on the outsides. I need people that are rolling and have strollers to be on the insides. So therefore, we don't have to worry about running people the hell over or getting ran the hell over. There have been so many disabled people like I I can't get past, you know, people are walking slow in front of me. You know, I'm trying not to run over anybody's foot or they just like stop randomly. And it's like, you will get ran the fuck over. Move, move. I have a bullhorn and I am not afraid to use it. So, um, so I have that. Uh, uh, everything is, uh, if there are, 
are um, if there's going to be announcements, if there's going to be any type of shows, there will be two interpreters on stage and then there will be four interpreters off stage because what I learned is that in when you interpret, you have to interpret in groups of two because you guys need to like switch out. You know, you get tired. Like like I would get tired, like you would get tired. You are basically interpreting live what someone is saying to another language. So two is the bare minimum. And then when you get more and more people, that's when you need a group of four or six. So I'm just like, let's just have eight people out the box. You know, we have, um, we have two people on stage, we have four people in the crowd, and then you guys just uh, rotate that way. So that's just the interpreters. Um, there should be a large teleprompter with uh, closed captioning. And the reason why we have interpreters and closed captioning, because those that don't know sign language can still be deaf or hard of hearing. So they can still read what's going on. <sighs> okay, what else? What else? Floats. We need to see more disabled people on floats. We need to see more disabled people in the actual parade. We need to see more disabled people running booths. We need to see more disabled people in kink because kink is not going anywhere in pride. We need to showcase and see all the people that are in the community and not just the same old cis homo white faces. <sighs> Okay, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> and I know it's like, damn, you really did answer that question. That was, but you know what? That's that's all I got. That's all okay, I got. Off the top, that off the top, that was yeah. Off the top, that was great. So um to to like support your answer or to like add to your answer, yeah, that's what I mean. How do you feel about wellness areas, rest stops, and disability workshops being a staple at Pride? Yes, and more, please, uh, for those that are um, that are autistic. You know, maybe having like rest stop rooms that are sensory free, so you can just—I um, wouldn't say it'd be like a porter potty because then it feels like it's claustrophobic, but just have rooms set up that is that um could be silent or there could be sound and then you know just people can just meditate for five to ten minutes wow well hey, that's uh that i can't believe i forgot that but i heard a whole podcast about that and i was like oh my god that would be so important um also discussing wellness discussing um having workshops around you know how to speak to your doctor how to advocate for self um what does what does having a disability and showcasing a few disabilities what does that mean um how does having a disability impact your work your life maybe your um hiv or your hiv status how um how to assist a friend that's disabled do they want your assistance you know uh social etiquette around disability um those things would be wonderful to teach the broader community because yeah. not only are you showing that these people are a part of the community but how not to be a weird asshole so yes yes to all, all that Yes, yeah. yes and more, <laughs> yes and more. And sometimes just like not being an asshole, sometimes that's just like, that. sometimes that goes a long way. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. it's obviously not mm -hmm. everything, it's literally just intro, that's just like <laughs> standard, but like mm -hmm. sometimes that does go a long way. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you can be ignorant and a lot of people most times will accept that and just like, okay, well, this person doesn't know. But if you like just roll up behind somebody uh, that's in a wheelchair and just start pushing them, you're going to get slapped. If you just grab somebody who's like walking through the crosswalk and they're blind or they're using a white cane, you're going to get knocked the hell out because don't, first of all, don't touch me. <laughs> Full right. autonomy right here. I am a whole adult. Do not touch me. Introduce so, yourself at least first. Hello. Hi. Uh, do, would you like any help? Thank you. Are you okay? What's going on? Thank you. Thank you, because see, that's common courtesy and that's autonomy. And a lot of people feel that disabled people are like um, um, big children, like baby ch baby adults. So they're like, oh, you need help. Let me help you. And it's like, I didn't ask. 
I don't need your help. And then that's where people, you know, have to get defensive and it would come off as nasty to some people, but I didn't ask you. If you're in the store and you're pushing your basket and I jump in front of you and just grab it, here, I'm going to help you. I, I didn't ask. Roll back. You might get hit. So <laughs> we treat disabled people the same way. If I see a disabled person struggling with something, would you like any assistance? Nope. All right, you have a good day and keep it pushing. Mm -hmm. They might be struggling for a reason. They might be trying to prove a point. They just may not want your ass in their business. There it so. is. There it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned so I learned so much on Twitter and learning like I, I really like to learn. So I have to really limit myself because I can literally spend a whole day just like, oh, so much information. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, Same. but mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but what I learned uh, by following a variety of people is that a lot of times when people think about disability, it's like, oh, like that's if something happens to you or if you were born a certain way or, or whatever. But what I've learned from a lot of people who speak about this is it's oftentimes a matter of when like mm -hmm. this will happen to you. Like, and that disability is a part of the human experience. It's not a matter of if it will happen, but it's when. And yes. Know how in the beginning of this conversation we outlined that disability can be physical and it can also be mental so again it's a matter of when so mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people don't see themselves in disability or don't see that like happening so they just completely disengage or don't want to even learn about it and then something happens we go we go into lockdown because we're in a global pandemic and all of a sudden people's cognitive functions completely break down all of a sudden people are hitting a pandemic wall all of a sudden people are severely depressed all of a sudden people agoraphobia they don't want to leave the house anymore and they they can't or they have some uh, some physical uh, disability and it's like oh all of a sudden i've i've arrived at this place and mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I think that that was really transformational for me to learn about that. About it's a matter of when, not if. You know exactly, exactly. Um, pandemic aside, everyone has or has had grandparents. You know that the human experience is we're born, we live, and then we we pass away. So in that in those later years before the passing things do break down you can't hold your bladder as well as you used to sometimes your speech gets slurred sometimes you become confused everyone thinks oh that's way off uh you, my grandmother recently passed away at the age of 80 from dementia that can happen to anyone as early as as what 35 40 early on stage dementia that can happen alzheimer's that can happen it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when same as adolescence same as puberty same as menopause same as all these other medical things that will eventually happen to a body a person it disability is going to happen so for people to not want to discuss it until oh you're 60 or 70. okay first that's creating the wrong narrative that all disabled people are old that is not true that is not true you can be born disabled as you stated as well as you can acquire a disability in a variety of ways but in the end we will all be disabled at some point it doesn't matter how well you take care of yourself at some point you will use a cane or walker because your hips knees ankles back whatever is is going to be like you know what i'm gonna give up the ghost Ugh. so there are ways that you can mitigate this. There are ways that you can slow the process down, but it will eventually happen. So there needs to be more conversation about, first of all, disability is not for the elderly. Disability is for everyone across the board. You can, you can get a disability. Um, you can also have undiagnosed disabilities. This is where you just see people in life and you're like, 
you know, maybe they maybe they'd move around better if they had a cane. Maybe maybe this person can't focus because they have problems processing uh, auditory language. Disability is we are one of the largest communities. We are 15 percent of the global population, but that's only the people that are disclosing. Think of all of those that do not disclose. Mm -hmm. So we're quite a large population and disability can range from, you know, I have problems handling small things to, you know, something that a doctor can diagnose. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. saying all that. Mm-hmm. What's your, what's your wellness routine like and how has it been going lately? Ooh, well, my wellness routine has changed because of the pandemic. Um, I am learning to listen to my body more. So my, my wellness routine involves plants. That is the first thing. Green energy is exactly what helps me focus, helps me bring in all of the intrusive thoughts and things. So I'm, uh, I use Wednesdays which is today, as my, you know, rotate my plants, make sure everyone's watered, make sure I've uh, moved my lights around so everyone gets uh, enough lighting. I water who needs to be watered. I change out soil. So that, and everyone's like, that feels like work. No, that's actually my routine. So um, I, so aside from my plants, I will... I will usually clean while I'm listening to an audiobook or a podcast, or I'm watching you on YouTube. <laughs> hey, by the way. I'm just like, hi, JR, how you doing? And yes, yes, you're a part of my wellness team. Mm -hmm, I said it. I said it. I'll be doing laundry and I'm just like, snap, snap. You can't even hear me, but I'm just snapping along, like, yes, it's worth it. Um, I vacuum. I, I do a lot of cleaning. I do a lot of like slow moving. And then once I feel that my area is clean, I will lay across this beautiful bed behind me. I will turn on my TV and then I will just veg out on, on a show or two or just take a nap or work in my journal. I'm, I'm getting back in, into working on in my journal. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Um, or I shower. This is why I cut all my hair off so I could shower and like wash my hair in 30 minutes and just be like, ooh, the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. So that's that's me being well right now. That's my wellness routine right now. That's really good. So I started like a couple of days ago, I started like meditating and I haven't done that in years. And I don't know, but like it, the last time I did it, it was just so good. And I know everybody says, oh, everybody should meditate, blah, blah, blah. But to be honest, there were a few years where that just wasn't resonating with me, but I picked it back up and mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's good now. It's good now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think like what you said about like your wellness routine, kind of like shifting or changing and stuff like it's, it's kind of important to do that because it's not always one size fits all for all the time. Like just because it worked for you five years ago doesn't mean that now it's gonna mm -hmm. work. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're not the same person that you were five years ago. You maybe couldn't focus because you had 90 million things to do while you're out here being awesome. So meditation wasn't a thing that you could do. Yeah. But now, you know, you're moving, you're moving a bit slower. You have more time to schedule that in. So now it's like, oh, okay, it's working. It's working. Before I used to just take a nap and I was like, okay, that's my, that's my wellness. That's my self-care. I took a nap. I feel much better. But now I'm learning that I, I need movement, but I need slower movement. I need to take things slow. I need to gather all my thoughts and things like that. So that's where my I'm working that into my wellness. I'm moving around, but I'm doing it slowly. I have um, I have something in the background that I'm listening to, and you know I might be taking notes on that. And I'm just I'm just slow moving because I can't do tai chi yet. So that's that's so yeah. I hear you. That's cool. You got to find what works. Mm -hmm. 
So is there anything else you would like to say about this topic? Because we are pretty much at the end of our convo. Um, people should realize that just because you don't see disabled people in spaces does not mean that they are not a part of the community. Disabled people are everywhere, but if a space is not accessible, you will not see them. That's the same with you can't assume that everyone that is queer is white. If the space is not comfortable and not safe, you will not see cutie BIPOC. You will not see people of color. That is <clears throat> also the same of if you're in a bad relationship with someone that happens to be bisexual. You can't lump all bisexuals into being trash. No, the human you dated was trash. We do not accept them. We do not support trash in the bisexual community. So I've, I've had to tell a couple of studs that, and it's just like, I go hard for my studs. I love my studs. I love my studs, my stems, my fem, all of them. But then we'll, as soon as they hear, oh, you're bisexual. Oh, da 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 Okay, why are you letting us trauma just like harass you like that, keeping you prisoner? I mean, you're missing all this goodness because you can't let that go or go to therapy. But hey, you do you, boo. I'm an exit stage right. So um, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great, great note to end on. I want to thank you so much for your time and for your tweets and your support. So, yeah, this was a really, really great chat. I am going to stop the recording.